Bitcoin has been perfectly honed through, uh, perfectly honed for its environment through its exceptional genetic code and the manifestation of that code into superior traits. It's the apex predator of money and it is constantly evolving too. Previous forms of money like gold couldn't take on additional attributes, but since Bitcoin is code, we don't wanna make very many changes because we want it to be stable, but we can introduce small little changes to have it adapt. Hello everyone, I'm John Chenot and welcome to episode 9 of the Bitcoin Path podcast. This is a show where we have deeper conversations about Bitcoin and self-sovereignty, about how this new magic internet money is changing the world and changing ourselves at the same time. In this episode, I'm really excited to share with you session one of the Cosmic Deep Dive online event. This session was led by Dan Helt. This was an interactive online event that took place on December 12th and the 13th of 2020. It was two full days of back-to-back immersive Bitcoin educational webinars with some of the leading educators in the space. I had a tremendous time in all these sessions. We got really great feedback from everyone who was involved. Uh, So keep an eye out for more events like this one that are coming up at thebitcoinpath.com. And with that, let's get into the session with Dan Held. I'm really excited to welcome all of you to session one of the first ever Cosmic Deep Dive online event. Um, Thank you guys for joining us. And it's really... It's really my pleasure to be your guide through what I'm sure is going to be an epic two days of just complete Bitcoin immersion. (laughs) Um, I started the Bitcoin path as a venture to just deepen my own understanding of Bitcoin and to help others do the same. And what I found in the process is that Bitcoin is really our best hope for preserving our ability to live meaningful lives and enjoy our freedom as sovereign individuals in this world that's just changing so rapidly. Um, And so my intention with this event is that each of you kind of get closer to to that end of living a meaningful life and and freedom, having more freedom in your your particular circumstance. Each speaker has a two-hour time slot Uh, They have material prepared and will pause for questions either periodically throughout their talk or at the very end. Uh, Be as open as you'd like with your questions. Uh, Just do keep in mind that the sessions will be recorded and eventually posted publicly. Uh, I only have provided each each participant's first name, so it's up to you. You guys can change your name uh, in the Zoom settings as well. Uh, So just be conscious of that. Uh, If you have any questions, you are, you should be able to raise your hand. I can, um, I can see which of the panelists are raising their hands and uh, give access to audio uh, kind of as we go. And you guys can unmute yourselves during the, during the Q and A if you have any questions as well. So with that, it's my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Dan Held. Dan is an extremely bright thought leader in the, in the Bitcoin space. He is currently growth lead at Kraken, uh, one of the largest Bitcoin exchanges in existence. Dan is a prolific writer and speaker with massive contributions to the Bitcoin educational ecosystem. He is he's even uh, part of the original 2013 Bitcoin and crypto meetup in San Francisco, which was actually had the founders of Coinbase, Ripple, uh, Kraken, and Litecoin, and some of the some of these other really cool projects. So, Dan, thank you for joining us. I'll let you take it from here. Cool. Thanks for having me today, and uh, welcome everyone. Hope today's session is entertaining and fun. We're going to go through. My, I've got two different uh, decks. Uh, one will cover what is Bitcoin? Why is it different than blockchain and crypto? 
and get into the weeds of why Bitcoin matters. Why should we care? Why did Satoshi make Bitcoin? Uh, so a good, a good primer and a good way to get us started. Um, you know, two hours is a long time to listen to someone talk. <laughs> I haven't uh, been to university. It's been 10 years since I've been in uh, un university. So, you know, I understand that this is a long time. So what I'll probably do is do the presentation on the basics of Bitcoin, the one I just mentioned, uh, break for a Q&A session have like a small break between that. And then I've got one on proof of work, which proof of work is I think a really interesting, um, another deck on proof of work, I think, which I think is really interesting from a uh, kind of like a physics-based perspective to understand how Bitcoin works. It's not just, just digital, it's actually anchored into the real world. And I think that's a very meaningful thing that most people gloss over. So, uh, here we go. Let me go ahead and get started. Uh, John, I think you need to enable screen sharing for me, which I think the easy way to do that is just make me one of the hosts. All right, that works. Thank you. Okay, so I think everyone can see this. See the screen. There we go. Let me go ahead and present. Okay, a little bit about me. I've been in crypto for approximately eight years. Um, to be frank, I'm just uh, I'm just into Bitcoin, so I use the crypto term because it's more familiar to noobs. And uh, over that eight years, I've worked at five different crypto companies, from wallets to exchanges to uh, data analytics software. So, have done kind of a wide range of things, and this has given me a unique perspective over like why Bitcoin matters, what Bitcoin is, and um, and right now I've landed, uh, so over time, I eventually made, found my way to Kraken. Kraken's one of the largest exchanges in the space. And so uh, without, you know, without spending too much more time, let's dive on in. So what is Bitcoin? And we're gonna dive in a little bit more as to the different dynamics that make Bitcoin interesting. So Bitcoin, Bitcoin is this weird thing and, and uh, John Oliver has a great way of putting it. Bitcoin is everything you don't understand about money combined with everything you don't understand about computers. At least that's how people feel like when they hear the word Bitcoin or they hear, they hear the word encryption. Well, they, they feel that because Bitcoin is very complex. It's the intersection of these different disciplines of economics and money, computer science, game theory, uh, politics and law, etc. So it's this really unique beast and um, <laughs> it's really for polymaths. And, and as we know, as time has progressed, there's been folks who built better and better content to describe Bitcoin. Um, you know, and that's where I felt compelled personally to go start writing because I had spent so much time to get where, to, where I was, you know, it took me five years to really like fully go down the route. Like I was always a Bitcoiner, but it took me five years to fully, fully grasp like the security model and proof of work and stuff like that. So, um, I felt an obligation to go make that distance a little shorter for everyone else. So why should we care about Bitcoin? Well, Bitcoin has the largest TAM of any blockchain project. Now, the word TAM might sound uh, sound new to some people. Uh, TAM stands for Totable Addressable Market. I live in Silicon Valley. It's a very Silicon Valley-esque term. And TAM uh, represents the maximum amount of value or, or the maximum um, value capture. So for example, if I create a ride sharing company like Uber, you could use the estimation of taxis as like an, a small TAM of what you might go disrupt. Bitcoin disrupts a hundred trillion dollar plus TAM. This is all stores of value, including gold, fiat money, and sovereign debt. So sovereign debt is used as a store of value and, and real estate as well. Real estate is one of the most popular investments for folks um, across the world as sort of like a generational investment that many people make. And Bitcoin disrupts all of these because it offers an alternative and it offers an alternative that has unique properties, which we'll, we'll cover later. Now, so how does Bitcoin, you know, essentially enable this new digital gold? Well, it's got a couple of different parameters and, and one I just want to call out in terms of the difference between Bitcoin and the, the existing financial system is the decentralization of it. Uh, no one controls the monetary policy, the code, the mining, et cetera. It's all voluntary input and everyone has been incentivized through game theory. So essentially making sure that everyone behaves honestly. And we'll cover that a little bit later. Um, so I'm going to be glossing over some of the details here. And that's where Bitcoin, when put in contrast with the existing centralized system, you've got 
centralized uh, methods of control and trust, where we have to trust in the central bank, we have to trust in banks, uh, we have to trust the central bank won't uh, devalue our money through inflation, we have to trust in banks to hold our money without lending out too much. And throughout time and all human recorded existence, we've seen them breach that trust. And that's what Bitcoin is here to solve. You know, I don't want to spend too much time on proof of work since we're going to do a whole new slide for or a whole new deck for that a little bit later today. Um, but Bitcoin is secured by energy, which is really fascinating. It's actually more like an energy money and it uses energy to create a wall, uh, a wall of security around the Bitcoin network. And the way that that works to incentivize miners properly is that that wall of electricity is created to um, protect the Bitcoin network and to issue newly minted coins. Uh, the transaction fees in newly minted coins, which are included in the block reward, which is uh, every single Bitcoin block has a block reward. Those miners are paid money to uh, organize those transactions properly and behave. So Bitcoin's uh, having events, which this chart shows, is the event where transaction fees um, should, you know, having event is where the subsidy decreases by half the subsidies in newly minted coins. And um, over time, we expect transaction fees to replace that. So uh, with this, you know, what I'm trying to convey here is it's showing a little bit of how Bitcoin works. It's showing a little bit about how uh, the halving cycles work, which we'll get into later. Um, and then also a little bit of how like game, the game theory behind Bitcoin, which I know there's a lot to cover here and it's really hard to cover succinctly. And over time, the way that Bitcoin is, is secure is through transaction fees. Uh, transaction fees replace the subsidy in that block reward over time to, to incentivize the miners, miners to behave properly. On this chart, we see multiple cryptocurrencies, which are represented by different colored lines and the total amount of transaction fees that they earn a day. The uh, green and blue are, the, are Bitcoin and Ethereum. And so when people talk about, oh, well, there could be many, many blockchains in the future, that's actually objectively false. Um, as we see over time, transaction fees will only, will only be meaningful for a very, very few number of chains. And what that means is that the security for these chains will, will only exist for very, very few of them. Um, and this is an objective statement. There's no way to get around this. This is just an inevitable thing that will occur. So when you hear, oh, I, I see all these other innovations, we can see here that their lifespan will probably be, won't last much too much longer, maybe another decade or so. But over time, they have some deep structural weaknesses in terms of security model. But we're getting a little bit, a little bit in the weeds here. Um, to zoom back out, some quick clarifications. Bitcoin is not a cheap PayPal. Um, it was not meant to be this really cheap way to pay for coffee. You don't need to store your Bitcoin transaction in an immutable ledger across 100,000 computers for all eternity. You don't need that sort of uh, security for that type of transaction. Uh, central bank digital currencies are not an innovation. So central bank digital currencies have been touted as like, oh, wow, banks are becoming like central banks. Like how, do, how does Bitcoin compete? <laughs> well, Bitcoin competes. It, it, the, the central bank digital currencies offer no additional value for uh, citizens and businesses because it's simply just the central bank exerting more force over the economy by being able to control every single transaction at a very granular level. And then like I showed you in the chart before, my personal opinion is that there's Bitcoin and then there's everything else. I'm not really into the other cryptocurrencies. I think a lot of them have structural issues. Um, I don't think many solve a problem. So my background's in product. I think about solving, I build products to solve problems. And I just don't see how many of these solve that problem. Most are just a competitive store of value against Bitcoin. All right, so we're gonna dive into planting Bitcoin. Planting Bitcoin was a series of articles that I wrote in 2018 um, to essentially clear up the narrative around Bitcoin's origin story. Satoshi's brilliance wasn't just in the genetic selection for his species of tree that he chose to plant the species of money, this new species of money. It was the season, the soil, and the gardening techniques that mattered as well. Uh, you could say it was his go-to-market strategy that, that was really critical here, and that's what enabled Bitcoin to succeed. So here I've got, a, I've got an image that shows like the pound, the dollar, and Bitcoin as different genetic code. So all types of money are, if you could think about them as species of money, would be have certain... Um, genetic code. And that code is written into an organism at its inception. 
Satoshi carefully architected Bitcoin's DNA or genetic code to be the best sound money ever created. We can think of, its gen of Bitcoin's genet genetic code as representing the instructions that have been written to incentivize the organization and coordination of cellular function. We can also think of money a little bit more esoterically. It's um, not just the paper in your hand or the money in your bank account. It represents something much more fundamental. It's the representation of work required to acquire goods and services. And that can also be viewed as stored energy. It is, the, it is a primitive form of memory or record keeping. And it is the collector, collective memory of who has the ability to allocate wealth. It's really just a, a giant ledger after all. And that's what Bitcoin is. Uh, that's what Bitcoin's UTXO said in terms of like Bitcoin's, uh, every, every one of our representative values in the Bitcoin ledger, it's really all of our aggregate belief in that ledger. Um, and then, you know, when it comes to different uh, traits, uh, in biology, a trait or character is a feature of an organism. And according to Charles Darwin's uh, theory of evolution by natural selection, organisms that, pos uh, that possess heritable traits that enable them to better adapt to their environment compared to uh, compared with the uh, members of their species will be more likely to survive, reproduce, and pass on their genes to the next generation. Money is no different. Money has traits that enable it to survive and thrive as a store of value, medium of exchange, and unit of account. Bitcoin is a new species of money that has vastly superior traits to, his, to its predecessors. And the traits here we have on the left, uh, for example, fungible means that one unit equals another unit. Uh, your home is not fungible. One, one uh, home or property is not identical to another one, whereas Bitcoin and gold uh, ha and fiat have that fungibility factor. Verifiability is your ability to go verify the asset. So I can go scan it. I can verify that it's authentic. Fiat has, I would actually maybe put this back down to poor or low because uh, fiat counterfeiting is a prevalent issue. And then portability, uh, Bitcoin is extremely portable. It's digitized and it can be sent anywhere, uh, anywhere in the solar system, if you like. Uh, Dhruv Bansal, by the way, the uh, one of the founders of Unchained Capital has some great thoughts behind that. Um, really, really fun to explore that sort of thing. But Bitcoin truly is this new digital money that can be moved anywhere in the universe, uh, this digital gold. And so you see that Bitcoin and gold have a lot of overlap uh, versus Bitcoin and fiat because Bitcoin takes in some of these characteristics. Um, and then Bitcoin also adds some new things like openly programmable and decentralized, which is much more unique and than gold, for example. Uh, like with, Bitcoin, uh, with gold's scarcity, um, we know for certain that there will only be 21 million Bitcoin, but we do not know how much gold is left on earth, nor do we know how much gold is left in the universe. Um, so once we have that defined scarcity with Bitcoin, that unlocks a lot of other really cool things. And then that programmability combined with that scarcity can you know, lead to a lot of really uh, interesting innovations. Um, but yeah, anyway, so Bitcoin as a species of money relative to other former species of money has vastly superior traits. And upon every new iteration of species, uh, they evolve through four different stages. And this comes from the bullish case for Bitcoin by, by VJ. Um, and so right now we're in between different stages. So we're in between the collectible and store of value stage. As Jerome Powell, the chairman of the Federal Reserve says, Bitcoin is a speculative store of value. We are not a world recognized gold yet. It is largely a group of Bitcoiners, including myself, who hypothesize that we are the digital gold, which over the last two months has been fascinating to see validated by the existing institutional types. So Bitcoin is at the very last stage of the collectible stage and moving very fast into the store of value stage. This chart is not to be taken literally, it's just for visualization purposes. So as Bitcoin's price increases, it increasingly moves through these stages. And the reason why is it penetrates the consciousness and the belief of the world. As the world becomes more aware of Bitcoin and buys into its value, it then enables Bitcoin to move through these stages and, and become that full global money. You can have be a global, uh, full global money and used as a store of value, medium of exchange, and medium of account until everyone believes in Bitcoin. So it's natural that you have, for example, the store of value stage before the medium of exchange stage, because if you don't hold it and own it, then you wouldn't be able to spend it. Um, and so when folks championing that Bitcoin is useful for digital gold or for uh, you know a cheap PayPal as a medium of exchange, are, they're, they're a little too early. That comes decades from now or a decade or two. Um, and then the unit of account is what you'd reference all prices for. 
Right now we use that in our local fiat currency, your local government currency, but in the future that would be Bitcoin. So everything would be priced in Bitcoin or SATs. And that comes at the very last stage. Um, after everyone holds it, it's used for exchange, then everything becomes re, uh, repriced in it. Now, world reserve currency doesn't last forever. Over the last couple hundred years, each world reserve currency has risen and fallen and Bitcoin is that final evolution. Um, extinction can be most simply described as the failure of a species to compete in an environment to such a degree that it eventually ceases to exist. The inability to compete itself may be the pr uh, result of two primary causes, increased competition from a superior species or a dramatic change in environment. Sometimes stressors are so strong that they are fatal for a species of money. While this is devastating for the money itself, the population comprised of those that survive are fitter on average. This isn't because any of the survivors grew stronger from the stress, it's simply because the weaker monies were removed. Bitcoin has been perfectly honed through its environment, uh, through uh, perfectly honed for its environment through its exceptional genetic code and the manifestation of that code into superior traits. It's the apex predator of money and it is constantly evolving too. Previous forms of money like gold couldn't take on additional attributes, but since Bitcoin is code, we don't want to make very many changes because we want it to be stable, but we can introduce small little changes to have it adapt. Um, Brandon, Quidham, Brandon Quidham has a really great uh, thought from where he studied uh, mycelium. And mycelium have something called a horizontal gene transfer. You're able to ingest genetic code from other organisms and Bitcoin has that. Okay, so now we know how, uh, the careful parameters that Satoshi selected for Bitcoin to be a species of money and uh, how, those, how, those, how, those, uh, gen how that genetic code manifests itself in superior traits. Now we're gonna cover season. So Satoshi planted Bitcoin in the middle of the 2008 financial crisis. And he did this because of, of this quote. And I think this really covers it well. The root problem with conventional currency is all the trust that's required to make it work. The central bank must be trusted not to debase the currency. But the history of fiat currencies is full of breaches of that trust. Banks must be trusted to hold our money and transfer it electronically, but they lend it out in waves of credit bubbles with barely a fraction of reserve. I think you get the theme here, the word trust multiple times, and I actually missed one of the trusts here. <laughs> um, so that's what Satoshi is solving with Bitcoin. He's removing that trust element and you can trust in Bitcoin's um, game theory, mathematics, rather than having to trust third, uh, other, than, other than having to trust counterparties in the real world with like uh, banks and governments. These are two quotes that I really like. Um, Henry Paulson, former US Treasury Secretary during the 2008 financial crisis and former Goldman Sachs CEO. He says, I believe the root cause of every financial crisis, the root cause is flawed government policies. Alan Greenspan, former chairman of the Federal Reserve is quoted at, to have saying, in the absence of the gold standard, there is no way to protect savings through confiscation through inflation. There is no safe store of value. This is what Bitcoin solves. It solves the problem of trust with the government having a trust that they won't dilute your, your savings through inflationary policies. And where we are now in history is truly unparalleled. This comes from Jim Reed. From, uh, he works at Deutsche Bank and wrote a research report called A Journey into the Unknown Long-Term Asset Management Study, where he looked at all recorded financial history, essentially. We have truly never been in this circumstance ever in human history. Uh, the amount of inflation that is occurring through these flawed government policies is enormous. Um, as we can see uh, noted on the right, the Fed being created. Um, there's other charts here as well that zoom in on this, but it's just staggering. If you look at 800 years of financial history that we are truly in a period that is unprecedented. This has been an experiment for a very long time. And we're about to see the unwinding of that experiment with Bitcoin. Fiat continually loses value across all regimes. This is the representation of a purchasing power of a dollar. Say if a dollar could buy you a hundred apples at the beginning of this chart, at the end, it could only buy you a few. Um, this is very common for all fiat currencies. There's another chart that shows the Roman denarius uh, with the percentage of silver in a Roman denarius over time. This is an inevitable thing that occurs. The temptation for politicians to overpromise different social programs and take away wealth from others and just redistribute it to buy votes is a continual pressure that will last forever until we remove humans from the loop. Uh, because of that and because of their sway over the money uh, supply, they will inevitably then begin to print money and printing money then devalues the currency. So 
right now people take their money before Bitcoin, they would take their money and put it into gold or uh, real estate or somewhere to protect the value. With Bitcoin, you now have a, a much more superior way to store that value. And <clears throat> it was in the 2008 financial crisis that really made this apparent. And as Vijay uh, Boyapati, I mentioned him before with his uh, great series, The Bullish Case for Bitcoin, he's got an awesome quote that says, indeed, Bitcoin rose like a phoenix from the ashes of the 2008 global financial catastrophe, a catastrophe that was precipitated by the policies of central banks like the Federal Reserve. And then in the 2008 financial crisis, trust had been lost in a world that ran on trust. Bitcoin was launched. Uh, Bitcoin was launched in a time of that. Uh, Bitcoin was launched in a time of absolute necessity. Satoshi planted the seed at precisely the right moment. Okay, so now we've covered uh, the selection of Bitcoin as a species of money, uh, the time it was planted, and now we're going to talk about the soil. So I, I really like this image. It shows a, a boy in London during, the war, during World War II reading a book in a bombed out uh, bookstore. It's very poetic because I feel like this is how the cypherpunks uh, originally must have felt when they read Bitcoin's uh, Satoshi's white paper. Satoshi wrote and created Bitcoin and, and marketed it to a small group of individuals called the cypherpunks. Those are folks similar minded to him. They were big fans of encryption and using encryption to create money and other ways to uh, do commerce and protect uh, liberties. So private, uh, private communication, et cetera. These were... These were the core audience for his initial message. And that's why I called this section soil. It was the soil that he planted Bitcoin in. And these individuals can, uh, were uh, these folks, Adam Back, um, Hashcash, one of the first implementations of proof of work, Hal Finney, reusable proof of work, uh, Wei Dai, B Money, Nick Zabo, BitGold. Satoshi took all of these different uh, concepts from these different individuals and sort of Frankenstein that genetic code that the, the each one of these individuals had created a, a cryptocurrency before, but it never survived the operating table. Satoshi genetic took all the genetic code and put it all together and, and shock paddled Bitcoin and it worked. He was the first one to figure out how to make it all work, but he was predicated on the genius, brilliant, the brilliance and genius of these individuals that came before him. And, um, you know, Satoshi actually felt like he was uh, late. <laughs> and he says a lot of people automatically dismiss e-currency, he didn't even call it cryptocurrency, as a lost cause because of all the companies that failed since the 1990s. I hope, I hope it's obvious it was only the centrally controlled nature of those systems that doomed them. I think this is the first time we're trying to decentralize non-trust-based system. So Satoshi, again, took all that different genetic code and built a, a, a digital money, a, a digital gold that finally worked. And this is a really cool visualization that I built together. Um, Enzo Linder created the original version of this. He's quoted in the bottom left. I took this and, and modified it pretty extensively and worked with my designer to create a little bit more of an interesting graphic. This demonstrates all of the, like I mentioned before, all the cypher, uh, cyberpunks innovations before Bitcoin. Bitcoin isn't MySpace. Bitcoin is the iteration of 40 years of research development and demand. That's where when folks say that they don't really understand or rock Bitcoin, Bitcoin is a carefully, very carefully chosen new species of money that came after all of these different innovations. And now that we've covered soil, we're gonna hop into gardening. So gardening is um, the, you know, Satoshi has uh, created Bitcoin, planted it at the right time, planted it with the right soil, the right community. And this is how uh, Bitcoin survives and thrives. So Satoshi chose to be anonymous, which was really interesting because that fit, fit the ethos that fit the ethos of the cypherpunks. People can project their hopes and dreams on an anonymous individual, ensuring maximal narrative fit. That's why a book is often better than the movie. His anonym his anonymity or his pseudonymity was a critical component to the founder's story. As developer worship can be dangerous for any project trying to be decentralized. As Satoshi says, with Bitcoin, we can win a major battle in the arms race and gain a new territory for freedom for several years. And in his public statements, Satoshi usually focused on ordinary mainstream users with his tone even excited and suggesting many ways Bitcoin could be made convenient or useful for things. Uh, so Satoshi was practical, which made his interactions very easy and comfortable. He tended to avoid political discussions and political arguments. And Satoshi took additional steps to signal to the cypherpunks that, so that Bitcoin wasn't a scam. 
He never spent any of his coins. He de-escalated, de-escalated his mining contributions and he didn't use his influence for uh, to be in a manipulative manner. He wanted to make sure that the world can make up their own mind about the project and judge it on their own terms. And unlike every founder in history, Satoshi never cashed out. So this is a GIF from Mr. Robot, a TV show about hackers. And I think what's really cool is that Satoshi was able to walk away from Bitcoin because Bitcoin had trust minimization baked into the protocol. That's what makes it socially scalable, a term uh, coined by Nick Zabo. Um, as Drew Vansall says, power and, and scale breed conflict and corruption. That is the purest part of that, that the purest part of any revolution is the beginning. It is easy to start with good intentions. However, as things scale, that becomes harder and harder to maintain. Bitcoin was specifically architected to be trust minimized. Satoshi set it up to where there would be no one person whose power could be coveted, usurped, or broken. As Alex Hardy says, Bitcoin is a social breakthrough, not a technical one. In Bitcoin, whenever a, fo- a person chooses to, to get into Bitcoin and, and start to grok it and understand it, it's really a hero's journey. Um, I love this quote from Mark Twain, which says, in the beginning of a change, a patriot is a scarce man and brave and hated and scorned. When his cause succeeds, the timid join him, for then it costs nothing to be a patriot. Bitcoin incentivized the early believers to breathe life into Bitcoin because Bitcoin had to have value. And when it has value, it's then u- being utilized to move and store value. And then its uh, price goes up, which then makes more folks aware of it. And then it also increases the security model. If you remember that in the beginning of the conversation, we talked about how Bitcoin's security model is predicated on the newly minted coins and transaction fees. If Bitcoin isn't worth anything, then we're not incentivizing the miners to behave properly. So hodlers represent that core fundamental human component of the Bitcoin network that makes it all work. He built, Satoshi built Bitcoin for the believers in a new financial system, the revolutionaries, the ones who were disenfranchised with how everything worked before, um, the ones who would be attracted by the sudden and spectacular change in their life of believing in something new. Bitcoin's uh, you know, pulling in is a call to a hero's journey. It's not just a meme, it's a representation of foundational values uh, upon which stronger cultural memes can be developed. Satoshi and, and when we look at, this is a great quote from Tobaba, uh, Tobias Huber, holding Bitcoin strapped Bitcoin into existent, hold, existence. Holding increases value, which increases demand, hash rate, network security, which in turn attracts new developers and, and devs. This self-reinforcing feedback loop drives Bitcoin's network effect, security, and value. Satoshi had encoded in Bitcoin a mechanism to incentivize the participants through the shared belief in Bitcoin manifested via hodling. And over time, we see that uh, there was really a really genius way that Satoshi uh, could lever uh, a basic core human function, which is greed. Satoshi knew that FOMO is an irresistible thing for humans. And in the next slide, I have a quote for him, from him. And Bitcoin's supply curve, as we can see in purple, is the new newly issued coins. And the green-blue color is Bitcoin's price. The sharp vertical drops that we see in purple represent halvings. So halvings create a supply shortage. If demand increases uh, a little bit more, then the price goes up, which then uh, builds this sort of viral loop. As Satoshi says, and he said this before Bitcoin was worth a penny, in this sense, it's more typical of a precious metal. Instead of the supply changing to keep the value the same, the supply is predetermined and the value changes. As the number of users grows, the value per coin increases. It has the potential for a positive feedback loop. As users increase, the value goes up, which could attract more users to take advantage of the increasing value. It's a brilliant viral loop mechanism built right into the Bitcoin protocol to uh, essentially take human greed or FOMO, people fear of missing out, and use that to raise adoption, to have the price go up, which means there's more tools, products, services created. There's all sorts of innovations created um, and, and built in. And then more core devs are attracted to go work on Bitcoin, which makes Bitcoin more secure. It's this beautiful, beautiful loop. The faith in the new financial system is what binds everything together. Bitcoin isn't just a software project, like I mentioned before. It's a, it's a social one. It's, it's, a te- it's not really a technological breakthrough. It's a, gain, a breakthrough in human incentive alignment. It's a method of coordination for a large group of people who face powerful adversaries. 
And Bitcoin is a winner-take-all technology driven by network effects. The crypto with the most hodlers, therefore, is demanded by the most consumers and will be the ultimate winner. Bitcoin promises an alternative for citizens across the world to keep their savings in a form of money that can neither be confiscated nor diluted. If Bitcoin grows much larger, it may force governments to become a voluntary organization. Through hodling, we may finally be free. Those who opt into Bitcoin are trading something abundant for something scarce, trading the past for the future, and trading financial independence for financial sovereignty. This uh, quote from Tesla is one of my favorite. Let the future tell the truth and evaluate each one according to his work and accomplishments. The present is theirs. The future for which I have really worked is mine. And for all the believers in Bitcoin, this is, rings very true. For those who choose to ignore Bitcoin or dismiss it, they're thinking in the present. But we're, if you believe in Bitcoin, you're thinking in the future and that reward is yours. Your reward is when everyone else buys in after you because they've taken forever to come to this conclusion that Bitcoin is this new sound money. Uh, many digital cash systems came and went before and after Bitcoin. Some, uh, most were just white papers, some wrote and managed code, some even built a community but it'll be extremely difficult to repeat the success of Bitcoin's planting. He built the exact right genetic code. He planted it at exactly the right moment with the right community. And um, you know, with myself, I, I think you can't really replicate that again. I don't think it's, uh, I don't think you can build another Bitcoin. I think Bitcoin is the only shot we have because its launch, its launch and, and creation was, was about as perfect as you could do it. So that's the end of this presentation. I saw some questions pop in. Um, John, do you want to play MC or should I just take a look for myself in the chat? Oh, okay, let's see. So we just had some comments there. Okay, I wanted yeah, to open up the Q&A. So if anyone has any questions over what I just covered, uh, happy to cover it. If you have any questions outside of that too, no worries, we can, we can talk about that as well. Yeah, and you can type the questions into the Q&A the Q and A box below, or or the chat box, or you can right now feel free to unmute yourself and uh, and tune in here. Cool. And I'll I'll give everyone about you know, 15, 30 seconds, um, and then um, John, you can throw a question or two at me, and then after that, we'll we'll move on to the next one. Sounds great. Um, but happy to answer as much Q and A as people like. I think that's what the value is here. If you've got any burning questions, there are no stupid questions. Um, I've, I've heard them all. I've probably asked those questions too. Um, we all along the journey have questions about how it works or why it's valuable. Um, so let me know if not happy to keep moving on. Um, John, do you have any questions yourself I can answer? Yeah. Um, I was wondering, uh, in, in one of your earlier slides, you mentioned that, uh, Bitcoin had, it, well, one in, in your slide, you had Bitcoin's fungibility as almost as rated higher than its durability. Uh, that was a, a unique thing that, I've, that I haven't heard of. I was wondering if you could elaborate a little bit more on that. Yeah. Um, Let me go back to it. When I think of fungibility, um, you know, a lot of I know a lot of people have cited that as somewhat of a weakness when it comes to Bitcoin uh, because of the not not necessarily so like rep uh like one utxo is not necessarily equal to any to all other yeah. utxos so the uh the low moderate high scales here are relative to each other so they're not relative like the right. high yeah. and moderate isn't relative to the column bitcoin it's relative to gold and fiat uh, with fungibility bitcoin is perfectly fungible on the network layer uh, one Bitcoin equals one Bitcoin. Um, and then when we look at how Bitcoin interfaces with the world, uh, there is no secondary market for tainted Bitcoins. There's no market anywhere in the world where you can go and you can um, spend less money for a tainted, quote unquote tainted, which is a subjective term, Bitcoin. So Bitcoin, I would say, is perfectly fungible in that regard. Uh, most US dollar bills have cocaine on them. It doesn't make them any less or more worth another dollar bill that doesn't have cocaine on them. And so we haven't seen that be a material issue. It's not an issue on chain and it's not an issue off chain either. Um, certainly it could be flagged when you move a coin to a KYC to AML institution. Well, welcome to Fiat Cash. Fiat Cash is considered the, uh, all puns intended, the gold standard for fungibility. That's why in every drug deal movie, you see people using cash. However, cash is not that fungible. 
Sure, you can pay someone with a briefcase of cash, but good luck getting it to touch anything else. You want to buy a car with that cash? Great, that's going to be recorded. You want to buy a house with cash? Good luck. So like, yes, sure, you can go buy, you can do like, you can do some things with cash where it's very, very fungible, but at scale, it's not that fungible. Um, Bitcoin has fungibility baked into the base layer. And when you touch KYC or identifiable information in the real world, well, of course, you're going to, you're going to have that issue. This would be the same issue for a, a privacy coin as well. Some people are like, oh, Bitcoin has privacy problems. It doesn't. Uh, you can use coin joins on layer one to get pretty good privacy. And then there should be some scaling solutions in the future on like layer two that should enable, you know, for example, like lightning that could enable much more private transacting. Um, <clears throat> So I don't see it as a critical function, uh, a critical deficiency in Bitcoin right now. Um, also, there's a nuanced conversation to be had around auditability and fungibility. If uh, we introduce privacy on layer one, then we won't be able to audit the 21 million hard cap and that scarcity, that 21 million fixed monetary policy is entirely why Bitcoin's valuable. So, um, you know, I think it's, I think we're going to be okay. I think there's probably going to be a big debate about it over the next couple of years, but I don't see that. I don't. I think it's pretty cut and dry. What makes Bitcoin the most valuable, which is that it's scarce, and we can audit that mon monetary policy. And by the way, I mean I totally believe that privacy is a human rights issue. That you should be able to preserve wealth any way you'd like, and you should be able to transact privately. Um, you know, I'm not at all against any privacy solutions. I just don't think that's like the. I don't think it's a. It's a. I don't think it's a burning issue that will create. That will be a failure point for Bitcoin. Regarding durability, if I lose my gold, there's at least some chance in the future I could <laughs> I could find it again. Uh, we've all seen those the Roman caches or uh, <laughs> the uh, you know we find those gold the stores of like that the pharaohs have gold somewhere. Well, it's still there. It just took us a while to go find it. With Bitcoin, if you lose your private key or you lose your uh, password to unlock your private key, it's gone forever. So. That's why I put durability as moderate because <laughs> it's, and, and of course, like fiat money is very, very poor durability, uh, but gold is almost literally impossible to destroy. I actually spent a little bit of time researching this, which was fascinating. The only way to actually destroy Bitcoin, because even with a bomb, it would just turn into dust and you could put it back together again. The only way to truly destroy it is to uh, you know, use radiation to change its molecular structure. So that's the only way to actually destroy gold. Um, so that was pretty fascinating discovery. So that's why gold is so high. <laughs> gold is a little bit more durable uh, than that. So yeah, this, this was the section on planting Bitcoin. Uh, this is a four part series you can go read about on uh, my website, danheld.com. Um, doesn't look like we had many questions come in. So I can I did have, and... I did oh. just have one other one come through sure. uh, on one of the chats. Uh, just wanted to get a little clarification on fiat money. Like, what are we, what are we talking about there? And so, you know, just a brief definition of fiat would be awesome. Sure. Uh, fiat money would be your local government currency. So fiat would be like the dollar if you live in the US or the Euro if you're in Europe uh, or part of the EU, sorry. Um, so yeah, it's your local money that is not really backed by anything. Uh, there is no gold, uh, milit there, uh, no gold backs your coin, there's not redeemable. For gold, um, the military does not back uh, fiat money. It is just the sheared aggregate belief in it, just like Bitcoin. Awesome. We do have one other question. Uh, F1L T3R is raising her hand. I think you can un unmute them, Dan, since you're the host right now. Oh, let's see. There we go. Yo. Hey, how's it going? Doing well. Are you able to hear? You able to hear me? Okay. Perfectly. Okay, great. So yeah, the question I had was, why the four-year halving cycle? Because I think of the only other thing I can think of that's four years is the sort of political cycle. So I'm wondering if that was an intentional uh, decision. Yeah, that's a fascinating question that I have spent a lot of time thinking about, and and uh, I'm not sure if I've got a good answer for, but I can give you my personal opinion. So Satoshi. I think was a really brilliantly understood human behavior. Um, he understood intimately how humans operate and how humans would interface with this new money and how to incentivize them. 
So Satoshi's got a choice. And so he decides upon a couple different factors here. He decides upon the 21 million hard cap and he's got to figure out how to distribute the coins over time. So he's got to figure out a supply issuance curve. And, and uh, I've had some fascinating conversations like Nick Carter about this, like what is what would, what, what would some alternative issuance schedules look like? So first and foremost, whatever he did worked. <laughs> We're talking about it today. So whatever he did either intentionally or unintentionally worked, which is pretty interesting. Um, I do think that if you look at like if the having site, if, if we had if we had a quick issuance, if we had an issue, a continuous issu issuance schedule, um, I don't, th I, I think that that uh, there is, there's some reason that for some reason there's a technical argument to be that that's harder to do than halvings. Um, so the continuous, continuous issuance, like a nice smooth curve, uh, some people th would think would be ideal. I do think that the supply shocks actually introduce um, a measure of inducing a market cycle. And Satoshi, I think, might have hypothesized that, that like humans don't respond rationally to all information being into the market. And maybe he thinks that issuing sharp drops would create a, a momentary, uh, would create a new level of scarcity. Therefore, any like fluctuation in demand becomes much more sensitive. So you sort of increase the sensitivity when you decrease the uh, block reward or you, sorry, the, the subsidy you've now decreased the number of newly minted supply hitting the market every day. Every price is a function of supply and demand. If there's less supply in the same demand, the price goes up. So I have to believe that he, he, he must've thought about it from like, okay, this is easier to introduce technically. And then also, so now he's got these having events that occur. Well, how many years? Like why not one year, you know, or why not one year and, and have, it, have it decrease like that? I do think, I mean, this is me largely extrapolating I do think four years is a nice amount of time. It's what we give, as you mentioned, a politician to make an impact for a population. Four years is also a long time in the startup world. That could mean a couple fundraising rounds going from zero to one in terms of like a couple founders in a basement to a hundred employees. So it gives time for, you know, when we have these uh, boom and bust cycles, the boom brings all these different Bitcoin businesses into the space that go build services and products for Bitcoiners in four years is a good amount of time for us. And, and trust me at, at Kraken, we're fully thinking through how do we uh, how do we scale everything for this bull run? And if we had bull runs happening every two years, I think we would just be in a state of shell shock trying to get everything ready. So four years is a conveniently, uh, a convenient uh, cycle for us to go build businesses. Again, this is largely subjective. I, Satoshi didn't give too much insight into why he chose four years, but I have to think that with everything else he did, it was very intentional. And I would, I think we'd be remiss to just say he just plugged this in coincidentally. I think it was probably chosen like very carefully. That, that's a great question. It's, it's one that uh, is very nuanced. Awesome. Thanks so much. Thanks Dan. That's any, awesome. Any other, uh, any other questions from the audience at this point, Cedric? Yeah, definitely. Um, Dan, do you think that the supply shock and the halvings become irrelevant at some point in the future, uh, just based on time past blocks issued already? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question too. And also Bitcoin can't, uh, you know, it can't go from zero dollars to, um, you know, it can't go from zero to infinity, right? So eventually, eventually Bitcoin is going to become like gold, where gold is a really fucking boring thing you have, right? <laughs> like, you know, when you're young in your 20s and 30s, no one's like, I'm going to go, you know, make my make my wealth by buying gold as an investment, right? We normally go, and by the way, I was a former gold bug, but but I'm an out, outlier. Um, it, it becomes a boring store of value. So eventually Bitcoin over decades will achieve that status. Eventually Bitcoin won't have, uh, you know, big cycles like it had before. It won't have these these bull runs and pullbacks. It'll just be the whole market in a way it'll be it'll be like gold right where it just exists uh, but it's not exactly like a speculative endeavor it's like oh i feel bearish about equities real estate and every other investment that would probably get me a higher yield so i'm going to put it into bitcoin so these bubbles are the adoption curves over time as bitcoin becomes a more uh, well-known global money uh, which is really fascinating so with these having events, you know, will these in the future have an impact, uh, an impact as big as we saw in the past? To your to your question, probably no. Um, it'll probably decrease over time, and we've seen that from like the 
2013 versus 2017 cycle was less intense. Um, 2013 also had like two, technically. There's one in March and in, in late 13, as we can see here on the left. And um, so, yeah, I, I don't think they'll be as big in the future. Again, Bitcoin's final state is to be a digital gold. And gold is actually a safe, boring store of value asset, which is good. We need that. And that's why Bitcoin's valuable is we don't have to trust anyone else when we hold it, right? Um, but yeah, certainly these cycles won't be as intense in the future. Also, uh, if we look at how many coins have been issued, uh, approximately uh, 18.5 million out of the 21 million have already been issued. So it's an exponentially, uh, or it's, a, it's a decay, an exponentially decaying curve as Bitcoin get, becomes asymptotic with the 21 million hard cap, that issuance schedule becomes asymptotic. So 99% uh, of Bitcoin will be minted by the year 2030. And then the last 1% will be minted over the next hundred years. So we're very much at the, almost the end of almost, almost the end of all Bitcoins being issued. And so I think Satoshi probably decided on that issuance curve. I think, I think it was probably because, because he could have chosen a longer one, right? Like it could have been a much flatter trajectory versus an exponentially decaying. I think that that there might have been a little element of um, <laughs> a little human element sprinkled in that because I think he just wanted to see if he was going to succeed in his lifetime. You know, so I, I think that he could have chosen much longer, like six year having events, or he could have chosen much, a much, uh, you know, instead of issuing all the coins so intensely in the beginning, you could have done it a little bit more flat. Um, but whatever he did worked, which is pretty wild to think about. I mean, this is, you can't really change it after it started. <laughs> it's um, a, a supreme number of variables that have been perfectly uh, honed in to, to make Bitcoin work. And it's incredible that it's here today. I've been in, been in the space for eight years and like, you know, it went from $10 to 20,000 because it, it survived and thrived and more people believed in it. But it, it's just wild to think about how perfect Satoshi got it. It's really interesting to think about how uh, the effect that that's had on uh, the nature of who is hodling as well since uh, you know the majority of the coins have been issued already. Uh, so early adopters have a disproportionate amount of <laughs> sway, I suppose. Well, early hodlers don't, you know, people who hold Bitcoin can't change the protocol. You know, the protocol is an aggregate belief. Um, yeah. So yeah, I don't, really I, don't, I don't mean sway in terms of influence over the network. It just uh, okay. mainly hold, yeah. holding the value, I guess. Yeah. I mean, there's a, of course, like we can pontificate as to like what the more optimal curve would have been or something, but whatever he did, it worked. So For sure. I think uh, that's a pretty wild success. Um, well, cool. Those were both great questions. I uh, appreciate that guys. That was, that was really fun to answer. Um, and let's see. So I think it's probably time for the proof of work article and then we'll, I'll open up for Q and a, give me a second to uh, change my slides out. Okay, let me find a second. Okay, we've got, all right. So this is a presentation that I did in uh, Munich about proof of work. Uh, one of my most popular articles that I wrote is around proof of work and um, why it's important and why it isn't a thing to be worried about. A lot of people worry that Bitcoin uses too much energy. And so this article goes into proof of work, basics, um, why energy consumption is not a bad thing and, um, and sort of the basics of Bitcoin mining. So per the first law of thermodynamics, energy remains the same. Um, just merely changes form. And Bitcoin ultimately is a thermodynamic money. It is, it is taking uh, electricity from the real world and bringing that into digital gold. And we can think about energy being work being done. And this was uh, started, this, this idea came from Gaspard Gustave de Cor Coriolis, I'm sure I mispronounced that poorly, um, who introdu introduced the idea of energy being work done. 
Everything requires energy. Everything in our lives is linked to the price of energy. Purifying water requires energy. Transportation requires energy. Manufacturing products and uh, requires energy. Cooking requires energy. I think you see where I'm going. Um, and per the laws of thermodynamics, energy isn't created or destroyed, it's merely transferred. This universe that we have is a universe of energy. And those are dictated by the laws of thermodynamics, which by the way, it's called the law of thermodynamics, not the theory. It's been around for 150 years and proven consistently many times. Um, in a free market, the cost of any good reflects the energy uh, used in producing that good. And because free markets encourage the lowest price goods, the energy used in producing any good is minimized. So the way to think about this is like, uh, let's say you hire someone to go dig a ditch. And uh, before you'd have very, it'd be very hard human manual labor. So people would go, and those humans require a lot of energy to go dig a ditch. They're very inefficient. Humans have been, been optimized for dick, uh, ditch digging. So eventually someone was like, well, what if I build a machine? A machine that could create uh, and, and be specialized for different type of work. And I input energy into the machine and the machine efficiently takes the energy and outputs a good or service. And uh, yeah, so, you know, essentially a long time ago, all that work was done by humans and that work was powered by food. And then thousands of years ago, our energy usage increased. So humans uh, were eating food and, and very poorly outputting work. And then we found animals to do more specialized labor. Um, these new labor, laborers though had to be fed. Large amounts of food was required to meet the energy demand of horses and cows and other livestock. But our prosperity increased alongside. Energy consumption, again, is not a bad thing. And in the last hundred years, we built great machines. These mechanized machines produced work, first from sources like wind and solar, uh, sorry, uh, water and wind, and then cheaper sources like coal and gas, and now nuclear. Now we've harnessed the atom to unlock uh, energy at the most fundamental basic human level. Here's a chart that has energy consumption versus the war, uh, versus world GDP from 1965 to 2016. Energy is very closely tied with standard of living. <clears throat> it's very closely tied with productivity, which is all intuitive because we live in a universe that is just energy. Um, everything requires energy. Talking requires energy. Flying requires energy. Recycling requires energy. There is no way to get around it. So again, I'm just hammering the point home that an economy is, our economy is an economy of energy. Energy consumption in and of itself is not a bad thing. And that Bitcoin utilizes energy to do something very productive. And oh, here's the per capita GDP um, per total energy consumption. Countries that have a higher GDP, a higher per capita GDP, essentially a higher standard of living, use more energy. For example, if you're in Africa, you may not have enough energy consumption to where you could go power or, or the ability to purchase a dishwasher, right? Or something else. And I'm very much overly generalizing. I don't hope no one takes this offensively. I'm just speaking in very, very overly generalized terms of like North America versus some other continents. Um, of course, there's, there's differences there and nuances. But in general, we look at like when you use more energy, your standard of living is higher. Cell phones, TVs, cars, planes, I had the luxury of flying quite a bit for my job before COVID and I'm using quite a bit of energy to move around. It's not a bad thing because I need to get somewhere. Um, you know, if we don't want to use any energy, we could all just walk places <laughs> instead of using cars or planes. Uh, using energy is not a bad thing. In money, which is the representation of the work required to generate goods and services could also be viewed as stored energy. I think this is a really fascinating topic. And this was first broached by uh, folks like um, Henry Ford and others who believes in like an energy money. Uh, thermodynamics and energy, the fundamental underpinnings of the universe, it'd be intuitive to tie our money to that. They could, they could get a sense for that. And that's what Satoshi did with Bitcoin's proof of work function. And that's why I think this is such a fascinating conversation. So proof of work. Bitcoin's proof of work was originally invented as a measure against email spam uh, called hash cash. And that was invented by Adam Back. Only later did Satoshi adapt it to be used in digital cash. And so Bitcoin's mining has two purposes. One, it mints the newly minted coins. So that's the subsidy and the block reward. And then it also protects the network. Uh, if you guys remember that, that pyramid of electric blocks, you could think about that as the, the wall, the electric wall of energy that protects the Bitcoin network. Um, so Bitcoin mining is, is useful for those two purposes. 
Well, how does it work? Well, proof of work uses dedicated machines and those are called ASICs, application specific integrated circuit. It's just a, it's a big computer or something. There's an easy way to think about it. Um, energy goes into, on the left side, we see electricity going into the machines and out comes Bitcoin. It's a machine that prints Bitcoin. It's a machine that prints money. And it, what it does is it proves that it did the work. Um, the machine repeatedly performs functions, basically guesses until it guesses a cryptographic puzzle. And then it receives Bitcoin as the block reward. The solution to the puzzle proves that the miner spent the energy in the form of ASICs and electricity, a proof that the miner spent the proof of work. It's sort of like a crossword puzzle. You can, as soon as it's done, you can easily check that it was right, but it, you know the proof of work that went into creating the crossword puzzle or solving it took much more mental energy than it took to prove that it was done. Um, and these machines are purposely only useful for Bitcoin. And that's a great thing. It ensures that the game theory behind how Bitcoin is protected works. So, you know, um, what happens here is that Bitcoin miners spend money buying the machines and pumping electricity into them. And then they receive the Bitcoin in the form of a block reward. And uh, they're incentivized to order transactions properly. And the reason why that, that occurs is that the machines, if the miners who own all this equipment and spent all this money wanted to mess around with the ordering of transactions, like a reorganization, uh, essentially the ordering of the blocks, the order, ordering of the time in, in this blockchain. Um, and by the way, Satoshi actually called it time chain. Um, it's a really interesting dynamic where if these miners misbehave, since they're paid in Bitcoin, they would destroy confidence in the currency that they're being paid in. So essentially Bitcoin's protected by the idea that if malicious actors wanted to hurt Bitcoin in the form of Bitcoin mining by doing like a 51% attack, they would have to be wanting to be willing to burn the money. So that's, that's what's so brilliant about it. It's a very raw, very beautiful dynamic where we have real world energy usage that cannot be faked or forged. Um, <clears throat> it has to be pumped through these, through these ASICs. And the only way that they can perform these guesses is using so much energy. And that then rewards the miners in the form of Bitcoin. So some people complain that Bitcoin mining doesn't accomplish anything useful, like finding prime numbers, which actually I mined prime coin back in the day because I thought that was compelling and interesting. This was before I fully grokked the dedicated, the why we needed a dedicated thing for Bitcoin. Uh, like why I was like, oh, this, this makes sense as like doing something more useful than spending all this work. Well, this work is already doing something useful. Um, <laughs> it's, it's protecting the Bitcoin network and issuing new Bitcoins. It's doing something incredibly useful that the market that all Bitcoiners are paying for in the terms of like anyone who's buying new Bitcoin, you know, they're buying these from these miners. So uh, these miners do something very, very useful. They don't need to do anything else. And while introducing a secondary reward for doing work might seem like a virtuous idea, it actually introduces a, a security risk. Splitting the reward can lead to a situation where it's more worthwhile to do the secondary function than it is to do the primary function. So that's again, why Bitcoin ASICs are only useful for Bitcoin mining. And that's great because if these miners misbehaved, they would essentially have to burn their equipment because that equipment is not useful for anything else. Um, you know, and another way to think about it as well is that marginal cost equals marginal revenue. So if the secondary function, even if it was just in a very basic form, like a, a heater, because Bitcoin miners off put heat, um, that would provide value. And so essentially, the, uh, the mining heater is just an increase in the hardware efficiency re resulting in a higher difficulty and an increase in energy use per block. Um, and so we'd, send, we'd move instead of like $100 per hashes, we'd move to $100 plus $5 of the heat that was generated. Ultimately, Bitcoin is about physics, not code. It's a super commodity minted from energy, the fundamental commodity of the universe. It transmutes electricity into digital gold. And so Bitcoin is a capitalist voting system, uh, money risked, money gained through the energy used to create hashes or votes. Um, and this was by Hugo uh, Nguyen, who came up with that. Uh, when Satoshi designed proof of work, he was fundamentally changing how consensus between humans is formed from political votes to apolitical votes or hashes via the conversion of energy. Proof of work is proof of burn or the validation that energy was burnt. And, and why is that important? It is the most simplistic and fair way for the physical world to validate something in the digital world. 
Until very, very recently, securing something meant building a thick physical wall whatever around whatever is deemed valuable. In the new world of cryptocurrency, it is unintuitive and weird. There are no physical walls to protect our money, no doors to access our vaults. Bitcoin's public ledger is secured by the collective hashing power, the sum of all the energy expended to build the wall. And through its transparent, costly design, it would take an equivalent amount of energy to tear it down. And so when people complain about Bitcoin's energy usage, of course, they never complain about the fucking castles that are in their country or the giant battleships or the vaults or the Brinks cars or all the guns that are used for the military. You know, Bitcoin's energy consumption, because it exists in the world, which uses energy for anything, is, is a, is, it has to do that. And we, don't, we would never shame someone for using energy to protect something because we already do that for many other things in our life. So uh, Bitcoin, some interesting stats here. Bitcoin is a proof of work. The, uh, Bitcoin's proof of work is the buyer of last resort for all electricity. So Bitcoin doesn't compete with other electricity sources. Um, it, creates a, it, it creates a floor that incentivizes the building of new energy producing plants around disparate energy sources that have otherwise been left untapped. Bitcoin can be, Bitcoin miners can be put anywhere in the world. So if if, if someone has a nuclear power plant somewhere that is not using all of its energy, Bitcoin will pay for that or buy the excess capacity because you can't transmit that energy down a, a line hundreds of miles away, otherwise you lose all that energy. Um, that's why power sources have to be close to where the power is being consumed, but Bitcoin doesn't care. You could technically mine Bitcoin as well in space if you'd like, um, you know, up to a certain distance because then you get the speed of light, you know, if you went too far out in the solar system, but that's where you can put Bitcoin miners anywhere to essentially soap up all the excess, um, the excess capacity. Since the physical location of mining centers is not important to the network, Miners flock to areas generating surplus electricity for the lowest marginal cost. In the long run, this has the potential to produce more efficient worldwide energy markets with Bitcoin miners performing an arbitrage of electricity between global centers. The cost of mining becomes the lowest excess value of electricity. This solves a problem with renewable energy sources that have a predictable capacity that is, that is otherwise wasted like hydro and flared methane. In the future, Bitcoin mining could help, help with renewable energy sources that have variable output. Energy producers can plug in miners and store the excess power as Bitcoin. So Bitcoin is not competing and soaping up all this energy where it's like competing with your ability to run your dishwasher or your TV. No, Bitcoin is is the is willing to pay the least amount of money for electricity and it's paying for electricity that no one else wants. Uh, so it's not really even using electricity at all. It, it just It's essentially taking the, the excess electricity that no one is using <laughs> and using that. So Bitcoin is actually being efficient. It's being super efficient. It's not, it's not wasteful at all. It's, it's actually harnessing our waste and using that to protect the Bitcoin network. And that is a virtuous thing because Bitcoin, as I mentioned in the last presentation, is an immensely valuable thing for humankind. There's a really cool analogy to be made with aluminum. Aluminum was a popular means of exporting electricity from a country with an abundant renewable energy source, sources that are stranded like Iceland. Smelting bauxite, also known as aluminum ore, has huge energy requirements and converting that into aluminum is a one-way function, just kind of like a hash. Uh, the same concerns around unfair energy consumption existed for aluminum 40 years ago uh, in 1979, including concerns of centralization. All of these companies constantly scoured the planet for cheap power and other concessions. As aluminum manufacturing matured over the decades though, the watt hours per kilogram of aluminum produced became more efficient. Same with Bitcoin. The uh, watt hours per giga hash uh, becomes more and more efficient, which means more and more hashes per energy used is protecting the Bitcoin network. And here's um, a nice chart that was done by the CoinShares folks. So 78% of Bitcoin's electricity usage is from renewables, which makes sense. Most of these renewables have a ton of excess capacity and a lot of this was overbuilt in the Chinese and some of the Chinese regions. Um, it's not because China wants to control Bitcoin. Bitcoin miners do not control Bitcoin. They are the paid guards that are paid and incentivized to guard the Bitcoin network, but they cannot make changes to the Bitcoin network and they do not control it. Um, and as we, this was done to, I made this presentation two years ago. Um, over time, this has actually become more distributed to Europe and North America. 
the pressure to, let's see. So, you know, through, through Bitcoin mining, the incentive to find cheap electricity sources may, may accelerate the effort to build fusion reactors. Um, Bitcoin is now an incentive mechanism to fuel innovation and energy consumption because, um, you know, because like, for example, uh, Bitcoin, as it grows, like right now, the Bitcoin network through mining, mining is like a $4 billion a year, just based on the block reward alone industry. And the next bull run, it'll be 40 to a hundred billion. And that becomes a huge new industry that, that can incentivize the tapping into of all this excess energy uh, across the world that isn't being utilized. And this could do really cool things like fund fusion reactors or fund other types of more efficient energy consumption. So you might have heard some of these before, and I'm not sure why my formatting here is coming in a little funky. Um, let me uh, change this up a little. There we go. Maybe that'll. There, that cleared up. Um, so most of these doomsday articles were based on the intellectually dishonest analysis provided by Alex DeVries. Um, the KPI of his choosing was intentionally misleading the electricity consumption per transaction, and that's for various reasons. The energy spent per block can have a varying number of transactions. With Lightning, Bitcoin can have a Visa equivalent transactions per second compressed into one transaction on chain. So the economic density of a transaction can represent hundreds of thousands or millions more transactions into one Bitcoin transaction on chain. Mining also creates new coins and secures the ledger in addition um, uh, to the per transaction. And, and then he also moves the goalpost as well, that um, he says it's not useful or that it's uh, okay. You know, essentially what these folks always do in these very intellectually dishonest to move these goalposts as like, oh, Bitcoin isn't useful. Okay, well, maybe it's useful, but it's not using renewables. Okay, it's using renewables, but it's displacing other use cases. You can never satisfy their, their need to virtue signal around why they don't like Bitcoin. But fundamentally, <laughs> uh, Fundamentally, it is it is kind of a ridiculous thing to, to say. Um, and that's why I call it the Bitcoin double standard. It's a play on the popular book called the Bitcoin standard by Saifedean. So relative cost, and this is where, this is kind of the most fun part I like. Claiming that one usage of energy is more or less wasteful than another is completely subjective. We've all fucking paid for the electricity to you. I've already paid for it. Like, what are you talking about? Like I have to, I have to espouse the virtue of why I'm using it. No one's going to go tell you that your steak costs more energy to cook and that you're a terrible person for it or that you watching the Kardashians on TV is a bad waste of energy. I mean, get the fuck out of here. Like, fuck off. Like, I paid for it. I'm going to do whatever the hell I want with it. Um, and I mean, if it would be ridiculous if someone came up to you in the street and said, oh, your bicycle isn't as efficient as this other bicycle, you're wasting electricity. I mean, it's just, it's absurd. And here's a great example. Christmas lights. When was the last time people walked around and shamed people for Christmas lights? Well, Christmas lights use more energy than entire countries. Oh no, it's what a terrible thing. People use energy, which is the core underpinning of the universe to do things that they wanna do. Huh, okay, well, that's, you know, it's not a bad thing. Um, and with Bitcoin, when you see people complain about Bitcoin's energy consumption, it's entirely subjective and bullshit because Bitcoin does something very valuable they've never critically looked at their own lives and all their subjectivity of, as to what they choose to spend their energy on. And it's completely disingenuous. And when we look at the other financial systems, Bitcoin's utilization of excess electricity capacity, remember it's excess electricity, consumes, must, uh, consumes magnitudes less electricity than existing fiat systems, which not only have power requirements of the banking infrastructure, but the military and political machina. The energy trade-off for the utilization of that electricity to secure the financial system backbone is a net positive for Bitcoin. Um, there's a ton of caveats. Um, oh, there's also some interesting stuff where like Bitcoin has had zero recorded worker deaths, whereas like gold mining has had 50,000 deaths in the last hundred years and, and tens of millions of deaths for fiat. <laughs> so, um, you know, when we look at Bitcoin's energy consumption and what it produces, it's extremely efficient compared to existing financial systems. And this is where I get a little fun with it and a little sarcastic. Yeah, this is efficient. Yeah. Bitcoin mining is wasteful, but, you know, an aircraft carrier is efficient. A more efficiency, giant, giant planes to secure a country, 
oh, yeah, a bunch of humans uh, shouting at each other in a pit. Each one of these humans has a home and a car and a family, and they all will eventually have homes, cars, and families. Um, and then there's the building that was built to build this, all required enormous amount of energy. Oh, here you go, going to every single local bank branch, the tens of thousands of local bank branches that had to be built using energy, the people that man them, who also consume energy and the electricity and maintenance to keep them up to speed. Uh, then you've also got the Federal Reserve here, lots of energy. All these people require tons of energy. They have these gigantic buildings that require energy. They have enormous costs. Oh, that building looks pretty fucking expensive. Yeah, yeah, that took a shit ton of energy. So energy, again, is not, not a bad thing. And I think you can kind of get the gist of the point I'm hammering home here. Is the trustless settlement of $1.34 trillion between counterparties with the added benefit of cheaper energy for all worth the $4.5 billion in current mining costs? The answer is a resounding yes. Bitcoin does provide value. It's ridiculous to shame anyone for their electricity consumption because they've, if they've paid for it, they're free to do what they like with it. Um, and so all of the arguments that you've heard about Bitcoin boiling the oceans, I think are just completely disingenuous. And most folks have never had the humility to look at their own energy consumption or understand the second order consequences of, oh, if you start to force everyone to morally support why they use energy, it just gets absurd. I mean, there's, there's no reason why you would need to. And finally, capitalism is about the efficient harnessing of electricity. If I make a plane that can fly faster and longer with less fuel, I'll sell more planes and more people will fly in the planes because the planes will be cheaper to fly on. So capitalism is always about harnessing electricity the most efficient and simple way possible because it means more profit. And that, that's the brilliance of capitalism is it's ultimately about efficiency. So that, that's the end of my proof of work presentation. I hope people found this it's kind of a fun foray into Bitcoin's proof of work and how that protects the network and why that's interesting. Um, but uh, yeah, would love to uh, answer any questions uh, anyone has. Said nice, Mike. You got a question? Yeah. So. What I'm trying to understand is um, what makes one miner better than another? And, and from what I gather, you, you get lucky and then you prove it. Is, is it pure power or, you know, if so, how come one mining entity doesn't win most of the blocks? Yeah, that's a great question. You can think about it like a lottery mechanic. So when I buy mini ASICs and I pump electricity through it, I get to cast more lottery tickets. And so... Uh, the way that that works is essentially over time, I will win a percent. If my mining represents 20% of the network, I would win 20% on average of the time. Does that answer it or, or do you, would you like me to dig in a little bit more? I, I think that answers it in terms of the, your strength is going to equivalent to be equivalent to your, your capacity to win. So if you have 20% of the power, you're probably going to win one out of five blocks. Exactly. Precisely. Okay. Yeah. And that's where what's really interesting with Bitcoin is that Bitcoin has something called the difficulty adjustment. <clears throat> so if, um, you know, if a bunch of powerful miners came on, they might be able to mine all the Bitcoin and like, you know, <laughs> it, let's say an alien spaceship comes in, you'd be worried that like, oh no, this alien spaceship comes in with this, this new processor and they're able to like solve every Bitcoin block and mine all the Bitcoin it actually works in a way that's, that, that is self-adjusting and it's called the difficulty adjustment, where as more mining power comes onto the network, there's a self-regulating mechanism that makes the uh, lottery harder or harder and harder to compete. <clears throat> that way, uh, Bitcoin's issuance schedule stays on track. Otherwise, Bitcoin miners could deploy all that proof of work and solve all the future Bitcoins, but Bitcoin self-regulates and makes that dif more difficult over time as more and more folks jump in to compete in the network defense against alien ai i like that threat model yeah, big, bitcoin <laughs> could survive an alien ai uh all right we got another question here yeah, right. filter filter i think you got it unmuted yeah hey guys um so yeah i i get a lot of pushback from people talking about proof of stake and saying it's more efficient and the way I'm thinking about it right now, this is just kind of to check 
what you guys think, is something that's proof of stake is more rules-based than energy-based. And so it has, um, it doesn't have as much time resilience as Bitcoin. That's my understanding of it. Could you, could you talk a little bit about that? There's a couple issues with proof of stake. One, um, especially with a proof of stake that has a pre-mine, which is like, for example, Ethereum, you've now perpetually incentive, you've perpetually entrenched an elite. There's no churn in the proof of stake set. Everyone will be just be staking and earning more and more wealth. And if you don't do that, you're going to lose purchasing power. So uh, with Bitcoin mining, there's churn in the validator set. There's churn in the miners because mining requires an upfront cost. It's super risky. And so there's churn in who those individuals are and who will earn the newly minted coins versus proof of stake, where it's the wealthy get wealthier. So there's a, and especially if you have a pre-mine, <clears throat> pre-mine where the money has been allocated to individuals who didn't do proof of work to deserve it. They just gave themselves those coins, which is the problem with Ethereum. Um, also with proof of stake, you have issues with like slashing. So your machine has to maintain its uh, internet connectivity versus proof of work, which can actually operate with very poor internet connectivity and even internet connectivity stopping for, mom uh, for moments. So for example, let's say um, the US, China and Europe all get cut off from the internet uh, from each other just for five seconds. With proof of work, it's really easy to know which chain is the most valid chain because it's the chain with the most accumulated proof of work, the most accumulated hashes or most accumulated uh, hashes essentially. So Bitcoin could survive a moment where the internet gets partitioned just for a second or even for longer durations because we would all go, oh, that's the chain that we're all gonna agree upon because it's got the longest accumulated proof of work. All the miners have mined and mined on that chain. <clears throat> with proof of stake, if the internet goes down just for five seconds, you're in a very bad position because now there's a ton, there's a ton of subjectivity over where the chain should be. Um, and these miners who do proof of stake, so they stake their coin, and they stake their coin because they put their coin at risk essentially to earn that yield. If they lose internet connectivity, they could be slashed. And this is, a, this is essentially to make sure that like they behave properly. There's been slashing mechanisms put in place to incentivize the proof of stake folks to uh, the proof of stake stakers to behave properly. And when you lose internet connect connectivity, now you might get slashed, which means you could lose your whole principle. Plus it requires a subjective mechanism in which politics are introduced where people have to choose which chain is real. Like, is it the Chinese version, the US version or the European version of the Ethereum blockchain that is the most valid one? And there is no way to choose the valid one. It, you have to politically introduce subjectivity into it now, whereas Bitcoin's is subjective. It's the longest accumulated proof of work. Um, so that those are a couple like surface area flaws with proof of stake. I know it's tough with friends who talk about, uh, you know, talk about energy consumption and how Bitcoin's wasteful. I put all this together. I wrote one of the most popular articles on proof of work. The easiest way to debunk this, because you're going to get this question a lot, is like, look, you use energy to watch the Kardashians and our government uses energy to build atomic weapons and tanks and stuff to protect our money. Why would Bitcoins be any less or more wasteful? Like you just, the only way to really get to the core issue here is to reflect back on their own energy consumption and in a polite way, you know, don't, don't be mean about it, but just be like, yeah, so we all use energy for things. I don't think anyone's ever shamed you for watching the Kardashians before. You know, it, most people have never thought about it, right? They just virtue signal. They just read about it in an article in, in the Times. They repeat it because it's a talking point and they know you like Bitcoin. And that's why they bring it up. That's why you don't want to bite their head off or anything in terms of like being too mean. But they've never really considered any of these other energy consumptions like tanks and planes and, and banks and everything else. They Most people don't even know thermodynamics. So, you know, it's... it's uh, it's a frustrating conversation that I've had many times, but you know, it's uh, when you've reflected back on like, hey, well, you use energy for everything you do every day, and no one ever morally weighs in on on your energy consumption because you're free to do what you'd like with it. Thanks, Dan. We do have a question from Herman. Um, yeah, that's really fascinating. That disconnection scenario. Thanks. Yeah, no problem. Well, we're all here with you. We understand that it. it no, I was just saying it's um. Yeah. Uh, go ahead. Uh, go ahead, filter. Sorry. No, sorry. I was just a bit delayed here. Um, 
Yeah, no, I was just saying, it's just fascinating to think about that disconnection scenario. And suddenly you switch from, you know, if you compare Bitcoin to something that's proof of stake, you know, suddenly putting humans into the mix as the decision makers uh, in that kind of a scenario would be potentially really dangerous, it seems like. So yeah, that's, that's really fascinating. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, it, it undermines the entire reason why we have a blockchain. That's because we've removed humans from the loop and this would reintroduce them. Uh, Herman is asking, is, is there space for more than one proof of work blockchain? Um, Certainly, uh, it's possible. Uh, we just really haven't seen it. Um, it's possible in theory, but Bitcoin's network effect has largely captured um, most of the spend on uh, layer one proof of work systems. So uh, also when people talk about diversity, so when, when, we, when we think about traditional like tech investments, you wanna diversify your portfolio into a hundred startups because two will succeed. But with Bitcoin, cryptocurrency and blockchain, you don't really wanna do that for a couple of reasons. One, Bitcoin, Bitcoin already has the network effect. Like it's already achieved that. You're not trying to pick the new winner, there, it'll be Bitcoin. Um, you know, Litecoin isn't going to flip in Bitcoin. It's not Litecoin for Litecoin to take over. It would require everyone to lose faith in Bitcoin and to believe in Litecoin. And that's just not going to happen. Um, and, you know, when it comes to proof of work, uh, as we talked about before, you want the maximum amount of energy spent securing the network. So if there was multiple proof of work layer one coins that were all stealing each other's energy consumption, it would weaken the security of all of them. Diversity in this scenario is actually a very bad thing for decentralization. Um, decentralization is actually better with all of that energy being used in the Bitcoin blockchain to protect that one network, that one ledger that we all agree upon, that we all believe in. I'm glad you like that, Herman. Thank you. Thanks, Dan. Um, depending on... Do you have another another segment you'd like to get into before before we close? Well, that's probably the longest presentation I've done in a while. So I, <laughs> I think uh, you know I, I you know really appreciate yeah. everyone tuning in and uh, hope it, I think people found it valuable. I I really enjoy answering Q and A questions because it it's uh, outside of my kind of scripted talk and it's it's a lot of fun to connect with the audience and hear about what you guys think and also it lets me know what the world thinks. Uh, lets me know that what people's questions are and. And by the way, th these were some great questions that were asked. Uh, I would say like everyone in this group asked some very good advanced questions. Awesome. I, I do have one other question as well. I'm thinking about the, just the ideological opposition to energy consumption. Um, like it seems, it's, it, it, it seems like this almost uh, sickness that, that like so many minds are, are are infected with like that we that they don't think that you should be consuming energy do you think that um where do you think that comes from yeah it, it comes from the um global in a climate change and global warming movement mm -hmm. um which i think is a very scary scary thing because if you extrapolate what happens here I mean, we're, we're, at a, we're at a pretty depressing moment in human history. I mean, if we look at all recorded financial history, as I showed earlier, the state we're in in a terms of like debt to GDP ratios is unparalleled. We've never been in this spot before across all countries. But then you have the rise of socialism, which is, is very scary. And Bitcoin is our, our one escape from that. Now, the rise of socialism, uh, the rise of, of I should be able to take something from you because I think I deserve it more than you is is an incredibly slippery slope and I would consider a very unethical part of socialism, um, which is increasingly becoming popular. <clears throat> climate change is a very scary part of this. I think climate change is happening. I think humans are the cause of it. I don't agree that we should give the government absolute control over every part of the economy to solve it. Governments are typically pretty shitty at solving things. Um, as we've seen with almost everything, they do a very poor job of allocating capital. But the amount of money that governments want to spend on, on climate change, fighting climate change, is astronomical. It's like twenty, like twenty trillion dollars. And I'm a fine, I'm a former finance guy, so I studied finance in undergrad. <clears throat> and this is a simple future versus present value calculation. 
I think about it as a future value calculation. We can bet that humans will create inventions that will solve problems in the future. Uh, in 1898, there was the great horse manure crisis in London. There were so many horses in London that the shit was literally piling up all across London and they didn't know how to deal with it. And they extrapolated using their models. They're like, well, for population size, three X's will literally be covered in shit. Well, that didn't happen because we invented cars. Humans are incredibly intelligent and we will come up with very innovative ways to solve problems that we've created. We are warming up the planet, but think about this. In the future, Elon Musk could launch a rocket into space and it could explode into little tiny mirrors and those mirrors could reflect 1% of sunlight. And that would cool down the earth necessary to counteract the uh, different climate issues that we have created. And that rocket in the future might only cost $10 million, but today it would cost $10 trillion. So it's really a future versus present value calculation. And I trust humanity's uh, ingenuity to solve this problem rather than government spending. And what's even scarier is once government starts spending, then they'll start to regulate every single thing that uses energy, which is everything. Everything uses energy. So then the subjectivity of the government in every single action in your life because of climate change, that's why they'll, they'll, they'll have the ability to do that because they'll be like, well, oh, your business is using energy. Oh, you're consuming that tuna fish salad. Oh, your salad, your uh, steak over there is using energy. Uh, let me weigh in on that. Fuck off. Like the, <laughs> energy consumption is not a bad thing. It's a very scary premise because in the world is wildly embracing this. And I'm like, look, I don't disagree that it's happening. I just disagree with the method in which to solve it. And it, it's truly scary because if you go down this rabbit hole, climate change enforcement by governments essentially equals socialism because the only way to enforce granularity of like who uses what energy is to have the government weigh in on every single economic decision. Um, see, Herman asked a question in, okay, so I kind of like talking about how the printing machine um, in the 1400s uh, changed, changed the world and, uh, how the internet kind of changed the world too. I, I think Bitcoin in a way is that a similar invention to the printing press or the wheel. I think it is a huge human innovation. Um, I think it's a, it's a really big monumental change. I, I think it's probably the biggest invention in human history to be honest, because if you're able to store value in something that's hard to seize and you can send it to anyone that you'd like, that undermines all governments across the world. Like that, that essentially enables everyone to be free. You're now totally free to where governments have to really reason with you before they could, they could knock in, you know, they could go call up your local bank branch and freeze all the accounts. So they can't do that anymore. And that changes the dynamic of the relationship between the government and citizens. And this is a good thing for humanity. Um, with Bitcoin, you have an asymmetrical weapon because you can store the Bitcoin in your head, you can store it somewhere else. Um, folks don't even know, they don't even need to know if you have Bitcoin. You've essentially now, uh, you, have, you have asymmetrical force to where like the, all the governments in the world could take all the computers in the world and they still couldn't crack the password on your wallet. Like that, that's an asymmetrical weapon that you can now hold in your hand. And you always deserved that. You were born free Governments took that away from you and then told you that you should feel privileged to have the, the freedom to even do the little things that you can, can do. But that's not right. You were born free. Uh, you were just born into a system that required you without your consent to be part of this whole system and Bitcoin enables you to opt out. Um, and then let's see. And then Lucas, uh, regulation is coming. Do you think that can be hardest for retail and easy for big companies turning, turning hard, breaking the concept of individual... So yeah, there's kind of a, you know, Bitcoin's being embraced by the existing financial system. This is not a bad thing. A financialization of Bitcoin is going to happen. Nothing about the Bitcoin code has changed. Bitcoin's core parameters, a 21 million hard cap, its principles, none of that has changed. And no amount of governments or companies buying it would change that um, because no one would want to go run that software, that version of Bitcoin uh, called government coin. If the government takes Bitcoin's code, forks it and adds in censorship, no one would run that code. No one would want to buy that coin. So I don't think it's a bad thing. Um, I think that it's it's representing maturity. Also, I think Bitcoin survives and ultimately wins the final battle between fiat money and Bitcoin and gold. Bitcoin will beat gold too. Um, it'll win that battle due to adoption. It's very 
improbable that regulators or governments or politicians would ban Bitcoin if they all own it. So if we get 30 to 40% of the population owning Bitcoin and big investment banks and very wealthy people owning Bitcoin, good luck banning it. Because if you ban it, you're not going to be reelected and people are very much not going to adhere to the regulation. Um, so yeah, I think that it's actually protecting Bitcoin, the more bigger companies and investment banks and investors that get in, because now they have all skin in the game and they're going to give a shit. Before we were like a small, tiny community that they could be like, oh, well, let's just like, you know, punish this little community into oblivion. But when it gets too big, it's kind of like a cancer. It's been woven throughout everything and you can't rip it out without ripping out the entire system. Um, uh, yeah, and Herman, yeah, essentially code is law, essentially. And that's how Bitcoin works. Ethereum violated that. Uh, Ethereum rolled back transactions in the DAO hack, which then said that like code isn't law, that it's sort of subjective, but Bitcoin has always preserved that, which I think that's an important uh, note. And then how do you see quantum playing out? Yeah, so uh, the NSA and CIA encrypt all of their files with SHA-256, um, or at least that's generally what's known. Maybe they have some other things, but uh, amongst, the, amongst the cryptographer community, they all talk and they all talk about encryption standards. We would know if they all start changing how they store their files. Um, it would become known that all these intelligence agencies are starting to change SHA-256 to something else. If they do that, then we know that quantum may actually be a threat decades away. They encrypt this information to be preserved for all eternity, to never be, to never be displayed. Some of this might be classified for forever or for 100 years or for 50 years. And so with quantum, um, if we start to see, if they see that threat decades from now, then they would start to change things now. And so they're, they're not changing it now, which to me is a good canary in the coal mine of, of if it would change, you know, be an issue in the future. Also, we don't, it's hypothetical that quantum could impact Bitcoin and encryption, but it's actually not proven. Um, it's a hypothesis that it might be useful for the application of cracking private keys. Um, but we haven't seen it actually applied that way. And we don't see anyone making changes. And also, by the way, if, if Bitcoin, if this impacts Bitcoin, it impacts every other secure communication system in the world. Um, and, and finally, Bitcoin can make changes that make it quantum resistant. So it's able to be upgraded to stop an attack like this. Um, but it, I don't think it's an issue for decades. Dan, thanks so much. We have... You know, 10 minutes, if anyone else has any questions, feel free to jump in and follow up. Give just a few more few more moments. Um, yeah, these were all good was, questions. That was great. You guys sounds like this group is pretty advanced. Definitely ready for the cosmic. You're very <laughs> cosmic. cosmic ex yeah. exploration. Well, cool. Well, you know, John, I think we can wrap up there. And uh, mm -hmm. thanks for everyone for attending. This was a lot of fun. Again, I don't get questions that are this this intelligent very often. So really appreciate everyone joining and, and loved the, the back and forth. Um, you can find all my content on danheld.com or follow me on Twitter. Sed, do you have one, one more question? I was curious what mic you're using. I'm using the uh, Yeti mic, Yeti Blue. It's okay. I, I heard I, someone else told me it's a good mic, so that's why I bought it. But I think that the, the, I heard the gold standard is the Sure mic. Um, but yeah. Sure. Well, let's see. We got we got one more question. The energy consumption attack vector is going to be a tough fight. Do you think pure economic incentives are going to help us defend the network? The answer is yes. Um, you can't. I mean, <laughs> Amazon's servers use more energy than Bitcoin, right? So like. <laughs> you're going to have a really hard time if you try to fight Bitcoin's energy consumption by trying to regulate the, if you regulate that, then you have to regulate, regulate every energy consumption. Like then, then, I mean, you should put meters on Netflix and, and, and ban people from watching Kardashians if that's subjectively a waste of energy. So um, I, I feel it. And also like, it's really hard to detect, you know, how do you detect Bitcoin miners? I mean, you can put those anywhere and they can use any energy and those, those look indistinguishable from a server farm or industrial use. Uh, so just like how marijuana uses a lot of energy with the lights to um, grow marijuana, you know, they can hide that energy consumption by masking it through other uses. So the same sort of thing. It'd be really tough for governments across the world. Um, another question is how long will the petrodollar still be? So, you know, back to the original deck I showed the, um, you know, Bitcoin represents a new money that has removed humans from the loop and isn't controlled by any government. 
I view the Bitcoin's rise, you know, Bitcoin moves in these intense cycles. I think Bitcoin will be worth, you know, Bitcoin will be worth trillions or tens of trillions in the next four to eight years. At that moment, it becomes an alternative to gold. And then I'd say probably the next decade starts to really change opinion over um, why would I hold my money in fiat or sovereign debt when I could hold it in Bitcoin? It could happen faster than that. We could see a super cycle where the whole world discovers Bitcoin value, Bitcoin's value in the next four years. That's that'd be cool. <laughs> that'd be awesome. Um, I'm you know trying to keep my expectations low, but the last two months have been incredible. Seeing all these institutions believe in the digital gold narrative, it's phenomenal. I mean, at this pace, like at the in 2021, we might see a central bank buy Bitcoin, and in that case, it's it's going to be wild. So. It, it, it could happen a lot sooner than we think. Um, but certainly, I think in the next like decade or two, Bitcoin will challenge the petrodollar. All right. I hope you guys enjoyed that session with Dan Held. I felt like it was an amazing just crash course in building an understanding of Bitcoin from first principles all the way to where it's at right now. So hope you enjoyed it. Again, Feel free to uh, check out our website at thebitcoinpath.com. And until next time, may you live a meaningful life and enjoy your freedom as a sovereign individual.